and thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Pam Singh, I'm one of the directors for the City Seeks Network. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to Inspirations from the Golden Temple. Um, it's a collaboration event between City Seeks Network and the Golden Temple Exhibition. We hope you've enjoyed the tour of the exhibition. Um, in this next part of the evening, we have a couple of esteemed speakers, namely Pomjit Singh and Guru Gassim Khalsa from New Mexico. After short talks from each of the speakers, there will be a panel discussion chaired by Jasveer Singh, where you'll have the opportunity to ask our speakers questions. So our first speaker for today is Pomjit Singh. Pomjit is an independent researcher specializing in the culture, history, and heritage of the Sikhs and Punjab. He is a founder and director of both the UK Punjab Heritage Association and Kashi House, which is a not-for-profit publishing enterprise. He is also one of the key organizers of this exhibition on the Golden Temple. So I'd like to pass you over to Pamjit Singh now. Thanks. Um, I, I tend to talk too much in these sorts of gatherings. Maybe it's my ego or something, I don't know. Um, so, I'm going to throw this out to you lot. If, um, at the end of this, for ten minutes, I need to do a bit of market research, I want to find out three things that you really badly want to know about your heritage and culture. Right? Badly. So, who wants to begin? What are the questions? What are the questions that have always remained unanswered? Why isn't there enough education about the role of Sikhs in schools, especially for example, the contribution of Sikhs in World War One, World War Two? It's been missing from the curriculum. Good point. Yeah, anyone agree? Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's the contribution of Sikhs in the World Wars. There's not enough about Sikhs in the, in the school curriculum. Take notes, Davinda. <laughs> You're going to implement all this. Anyone else? Lady? We'll take turns, boys, girls. Why is there a missing opportunity? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, maybe there is something going on here. I got that too. Yeah. Straight away. Ladies, come on. Start the lady side. What's the big question that's always remained on? I suppose a similar thing. Um, why isn't the secret isn't to try to more? on the news and the media, I think. Yeah, so media profile, a bit low. Yeah, good, yeah. okay. Any other males apart from, we'll work our way around the scene. Sorry, we'll come back. You've got about 34, I reckon. Um, <laughs> look, Giza. Oh, okay. I would like to know why we are called Sikhs. Why we are called Sikhs? That's a very good question. I'm giving you all the material. The <laughs> says we are Sikhs. Oh, pronunciation is this? And the Gurbani says we are six, we are not six. Six yeah. means Orion God. Is it? Yes. Okay, maybe that's just a language thing. <laughs> yeah, but that means that we are actually handling to how people want to listen. So should we say Paris or should we say in England, Paris? No, you say the way a guru told you to say. That is six. Okay, sorry. We had a question, I think, over there. Yes, we did. Okay, the good lady, point. Don't the pander to... The, the lady of the... Don't pander. I'm going to Actually, sure. I'd like to know about, like, you know, the Sikh gurus, they taught us about humanity. And somewhere along the line in the middle, it got lost. Well, the Sikhs don't, you know, they do parts, but it's not really recognized. People aren't acknowledging it. Why is that? So you think Isn't the Sikhs... time that we got back to it? Because I do humanitarian projects now. And I just feel that it's very, very important because, like Guru Gobind Singh said, that the human race is one, hmm. and to treat everybody as, you know, one and universal. So it doesn't matter what religion they are, but to treat them as one. There's still something to hold, but he's you know, and the caste system still comes in. It shouldn't be. Hmm. We're all part of one life. Sorry, I just no, no, great, great, you know, one, the one. <laughs> Why not? Next. <laughs> Great. I, I sat next to you at the Sikhs. I spoke to you, Did you on the phone. Oh, great. And Devinda's over there. Yeah. <laughs> he's over there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah, there you go. Anyone else? G gentlemen, men, man. I have one, which is uh, we're in the land of the mother of all parliaments here. Why is the political establishment in the UK afraid of the turban? Uh, what's under the turban <laughs> afraid of, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Actually, you say that, it's funny. I'm not putting parties are interested in having a, a seat with a turbo in the House of Parliament. I I, I, it's, that's really interesting because I went to, I used to work in London, and then once I went to the toilets, okay, it's not going to be that sort of thing, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that sort of story. The caretaker there is a guy called Brian, he's from Nottingham. And he's cleaning the toilets and, oh, and I wash my hands. And he says, oh, I love the Sikhs, they're the best people in the world. And I go, you what? And he goes, yeah. And he says, my daughter at school, she had a Sikh teacher. And it was an all-girls school. And this Sikh teacher, Mr. Singh, um, he... <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> he said he did a fantastic thing one day, because all the girls used to say to him, what's under your turban? He used to get this message a lot. They never, you know, they always sort of query. And then one day he went in, and I think he did an assembly. He took his turban off in front of them, and he's let his hair down. He said, there you go. <laughs> and they kind of fell in love with them, and you know, they, they thought, what a wonderful thing. So maybe, just maybe, you've got to go out there and let your hair down. <laughs> in an educational context, I, I, I hasten to ask. No, I'm not talking pubs, clubs here, yeah? If anyone's recorded there, I did not say that. I did not say that. So yeah, maybe it's about outreach, you know. It's about raising our profile ourselves. We are, we are part of the problem, I suppose. We are part of the problem, I suppose. I think the profile, sorry, we don't have this. The profile, sadly, is linked with other faith. People like Osama bin Laden we're linked with yeah. because we're the turban. It's yeah. the negative connotation. The media pushes this. Yeah. And there's no distinction being made with, with our sort of heritage. There's no distinction. The media's not interested. Do you think that the issue is, because um, there's another issue, because I, I, I bet you if I said all those people who don't wear turbans, put your hand up if you think the Sikh, if you could, go on. Hi, don't, don't be shy, put it loud and loud. <coughs> if you don't have a turban and you call yourself a Sikh, put your hand up. Hi, please. Right up, straight up. Oh, no, blokes, do that, blokes, blokes, blokes. <laughs> blokes, sorry. All right, yes, blokes, blokes. You might be Sikh, or you might be Yeah, no, but, th but this is this is an interesting point that if you're gonna, if we're gonna perpetually uh, anchor ourselves to the identity, we're gonna maybe miss the, the tree for the, the wood for the trees. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right? Because maybe the message should be, and this is something I'm gonna throw out later on. Maybe we should be pushing Guru Nanak's message first. Do that properly for a good generation or two, and then move on. Maybe. You mean like the humanitarian stuff? Or yeah, maybe. And maybe do a, a real badass uh, documentary project on his life and where he went and go back and visit all those people and places he went. So you get a completely different picture of Guru Nanak. That reflects, you know, modern day humanity. Two generations of a long time. Mm. If you don't, if, if you rush things, and this has always been the thing, you'll never ever do it paka. It will be kacha. It's true. Why the rush? It's just the ego having a go, saying I want to But you need to have some short term gains. You need to have some... You probably don't, things. actually. I'm not sure if Why? you can afford to be lazy and wait, because 25 years later, we're still going to get justice from 984. So, you know, we just keep sitting around ignoring all this stuff and hoping that it will come together. Like the lady said over there, you know, ultimately it's in our responsibility to do it. It's for us to go to the Gurdwaras, for us to talk about getting the money, talk about putting, channeling that into the right initiatives and having a strategy to do it not sitting back and hoping that someone's going to do it for us. It's very cogent and heartfelt, I like that. The only issue you've got is, if you don't make allies in the way the Guru... Oh, right. I'm not saying that you don't lobby. Huh. I'm not saying that you don't lobby. <laughs> it's not lobbying in the sense. It's saying that you do what Brian, Brian's daughter's teacher did. You get, get uh, connected at a fundamental level, so that young people growing up, I, you've got a, maybe this generation isn't interested. Maybe you've got to work on the next generation, and the very best seats you become teachers and let their head out. Because then you'll get lots of allies. I think we've all got opportunities to do things in our own way. Oh, for sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. All okay, we've got to we... do is serve people. Yeah. 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 If people know we are the people who will serve them, we have no problem. Wonderful. Right, true. Pardon me. That's your ten minutes up. <laughs> <laughs> Already? We've got some good notes, Dave, yeah? yeah. <laughs> Implement tomorrow, yeah? <laughs> okay, thank you. What up? Thank you, Pongit. Um, our um, second speaker today is Guruka, Guruka Singh, who has travelled all the way from New Mexico um, to be with us. Guruka Singh was one of the first Kundalini Yoga teachers trained by Yogi Bhajan. He has worked in technology related businesses for over 30 years. He is a co founder and, uh, of the computer consulting firm Sun and Sun. 
and now serves as CEO and director of Seeknet.com. And Seeknet happens to be the most popular Seek website in the world. So I would like to pass you over to Guru Singh now. Thank you. I come from a little Gorda pin <laughs> in the wild, wild west of the USA. And I say that a little humorously, but it's true. We're about 400 Khalsa who live out in the desert. Lots of children in our community. Our Gurdwara was hand built by the Sangat, as was our Langar Hall. And it's a very beautiful Sangat. So the thing I feel when I come here, everybody says to me, how do you like the UK? And I say, I feel at home here because I feel that I'm in my sangat here, mm -hmm. and I feel at home. So I'm very happy to be with everyone tonight. We had a, a marvelous tour that was kind of cut short upstairs, in which I'm looking forward to the rest of it. And it was very much about our, our history. Uh, but I'm going to talk on a different subject than our history which is, first of all, how many of you who are standing here tonight have been to Harmandir Sahib? Raise your hand. Okay, how many have not been? Just a few. For those of you who have been, I think that the experience of actually being there is not something that I can put into words because it's, it's beyond anything you can expressed to anyone. Harmandir Sahib has a physical structure and presence, but it also has a subtle <coughs> presence. And I know that Harmandir Sahib is, is in my heart, because when I close my eyes and meditate, I can feel exactly what it feels like to be, to be there. And when I, when I left Harmandir Sahib the first time I went, I said, I never want to forget how this feels. That was my prayer when I bowed my head. I said, don't let me ever lose this feeling. And so my prayer was that it, it would always be with me in my heart. So even though Harmandir Sahib has been destroyed and rebuilt twice, the subtle structure of it has always been there. And you know, around the Purkarma there are, there are places where people bathe, and one of them is the uh, Baba Buddha tree. Have you been there and seen it? And have you seen that there are thousands of sparrows that come and sit in that tree every night? And they, they come and they, in the morning, just as, as the, the kirtan is beginning in the morning, you know, they start singing their hearts out. And in that moment, you know, they they merge in God through the power of the Shabbat. And then those sparrows go to die. Everyone thinks it's the same sparrows that comes back every night. But each night there are new sparrows who have come because they've come to merge in that vibration before they leave their bodies. You sit there and watch and you'll see it's the most sublime thing. So I wanted to ask something special of you tonight, which is I'd like to kind of work with my beloved sister, Navleen, and take you on a tour of the Prakarma. And we'll do that through poetry, but what it requires of you is that you kind of set your cameras and things down for a few minutes and close your eyes and go on a journey in your imagination. Are you willing to Surrender for five minutes and, and join me on a journey? Yes or no? Yes. yes. If you're not, you can just come <laughs> stand. It's okay. okay. Come and join me, thank you. Okay, first, I just want everyone to kind of stand relaxed and close your eyes. Nobody's going to take your stuff, it's cool. <laughs> Okay, and just kind of let your shoulders relax. If you're, if you're holding stuff, you know, set it down. You can put it between your legs. It's okay. And with your eyes closed, just take a really deep breath and feel yourself as the breath comes in. 
and just center yourself, ground yourself, and, and slow your mind down a little and prepare yourself to go on this journey. Inhale really deep. And then exhale. And feel the tension kind of going out of your shoulders and your body relaxing. Your feet are firmly planted and you feel balanced. Inhale deep again. And exhale and kind of let the tension of the day fall away. We've all been running around busy and doing things. Again, inhale deep. And relax your breath. And keep your eyes closed. And let yourself go into your imagination. And just listen. Parikarma. Guru Ram Das ka vado darbar Hari mandir akal ki sarkar Jo prani le aave pet Brahm sahai akal ki te Sri chand ka buta brahm Taram aya nipte sab karm Dukh panjani me kare isnan Mukti meher sukh kalyan Baba Atal ki gaye arti Par Brahm sada sad sarthi Mata Kola ko namaskar Gyan Gobind antar pyar Babe deep ki chonki ai Sarib shaheed hoye sahai Ilachi bear ka ai asthan Seva Brahm sarup ardhan Dandot kar harimandar mehsaje Siri Guru Granth Jahan Viraje Har Ki Pori Amrit Piya Sada Sukh Anand Meh Jiya Akal Takhat Pe Tekya Matha Brahm Gyan Mitya Sab Likha Nishan Guru Ke Vare Mahan Har Gobind Sad Kare Kalyan Babe Budde Ki Ayo Bed Sarv Icha Puran nahi kach te Gur par karma dandot kar aaye Guru Ram Das hoye sahai Jo prani tiyave kar tiyan Par Brahm anand sagal kalyan The royal court of Guru Ram Das Magnificent Harimandar, seat of the immortal God Whoever makes an offering here, Brahma protects him and Akal is ever his support. The tree of Babasidichan, where Dharma is planted and Karma uprooted. Bathing at the Dukbanjan tree brings liberation, compassion, freedom, and joy. Singing the Arti of Baba Atal, God will always be your friend. Bowing to Mata Kolan, God's divine knowledge and love well up inside you. Coming to the seat of Baba Deep Singh, all the martyrs come to serve you. Arriving at the place of the Lach Bear, you're blessed with God's service and the gift of giving. Bowing and entering the Harimandra, where Siddhi Guru Granth is enthroned. Sip the Amrit from God's own stairs. Comfort and joy come to fill your soul. Bow your forehead at the Akal Takat. Divine understanding comes and all karmas are paid. The flags of the Guru are glorious. Guru Hargobind offers liberation. Coming to Baba Buddha's tree, all your desires are instantly fulfilled. Completing the walk around the Harimandar, bow your head, and Guru Ram Das becomes your protector. Whoever performs this meditation shall be blessed by God with liberation and indescribable joy. Brahm Parkas Kar Parikarma Dehalij Te हर मंदिर दिलो मथा टे चौरासी दे कर्म कमाए मिट जानगे सदा ले लेख 
ज्ञान ध्यान ब्रह्म प्रकाश दी डूंगी लगे मेक अनसुनिया अनहद सुने अनडिठिया सब कुछ वेक हर जी योग कमाए तू प्राण पति के लेक After circling the parkarma bow your forehead with love at the door of Hari Mandir The karmas of 8.4 million lives fall away and your accounts are all erased Wisdom meditation and God's radiance are deeply embedded within you The music of the spheres rings out all invisible things are revealed and enjoying union with god the giver of breath you are blessed with your destiny why did you come to us thank you so much guru kasing and um, we'd like to um, open the uh, have our speakers open to questions now and the Q&A and discussion will be led by just for these things so if I like to pass it to you thanks well it seems like Tamji has already started the Q&A so my job is a bit um, redundant let's say um, but um what further questions have we got the way that I'll be doing this is I'll be taking two or three questions in a row and I'll be putting it to either Guru Kar Singh or Kamjeet Singh as is appropriate so whatever questions you have please let me know what are you looking for uh as so they please let me know who the questions are for whether it's for both of them or whether it's for either or um do we have a first question <laughs> what a question is such just a comment um i read in the news yesterday there are um, the scientists have discovered 8.7 million species i don't know if you any any of you it's pretty close to 8.4 million specified in in our grand and by guru nanak and also by the in the hindu vedas before that so just a comment so it's pretty accurate yeah okay thank you very much uh anybody who has a question yes if if the guru said that god is within you what need is there to go to home and the side or other places of worship that's fine okay it's a good question um is there another question from anybody what did you call so what did you put there question for guru gopi um just really want to know what you think about from these comments about by or the beauty comments about how to fit into society we should let our hair down <laughs> okay well let's start with that question first and then we'll move on to the uh, the previous question so good luck see you off again for you okay okay he's doing his job i uh, went to teach to a very uh, six year old in school what six year old 10th grade so no fourth grade or young yeah, kids yeah, little kids six year old <laughs> seven year old and the first question they asked me was why are you dressed like that and so i explained to them why i dress like this for my personal reasons and then the second question was what's under your turban and so i said come on everybody come close and i unwound my turban and placed it on the desk and i took my ganga and combed my hair down to all the kids and they all went oh wow you know that's so cool and then i showed them how i do my ganga and make my jura i said okay you want to see how to make a turban and i tied my turban back and then everyone said we want a turban <laughs> cuz i explained it. it was a crown like a crown that a king or a queen wears a crown and it it means that you're in your royal majesty of who you are. Now what kid doesn't play at being a king or a queen? A princess or a prince, you know? And they all said, "Will you show us how to make turbans?" And they, the teacher who is the normal class teacher went and got some cloth and we spent the rest of the time making turbans. So, I don't think the comment is literal that you go out in public with your hair down. It means don't be aloof from people or feel separate because you look different. but create a connection with people and let them know that you're really just like them except you kept your hairs 
and you like to keep them neat and clean, then tie them up. It's that simple. So I think that's what that was really about. Now, moving on to the um, second question. Uh, the second question was, if God resides within and in your heart, then why do Sikhs need to go to the Dabba side? Uh, I'll start with uh, Pamji. Well, I mean, Pamji, you obviously organize this exhibition, so the Golden Temple is very close to your heart. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Um, is it? I don't know if many people know, but not all the gurus actually went to the Golden Temple. Uh, Guru Gaur Singh never visited. Mm. Um, but that's not to say they didn't have a, an involvement in the, in the running of it to make sure it was um, doing, fulfilling its objective. Um, um, yeah, Guru Gaur Singh never went to the Golden Temple. But he did have a hand in its um, administration to make sure things were being done according to Mariyadda or the, the ways um, that, that were established um, in times of Guru Arjun. Whether or not you need to go to a place of pilgrimage to find God, I don't know. I'll tell you when I get there. Um, I suspect um, it's one of those things that I, I'll never be able to answer convincingly. My personal thing, I suppose the whole point of coming to one place, or the Guru's Dabar as it were, which is, this is uh, the, the Dabar Sahib, the exalted court of the Guru, was so that you at least got a chance of, like Guruka said, making a connection or renewing a connection that may have sort of run a bit thin or whatever, dried out. So, yeah, it's a great place to charge your batteries and, uh, and you know, take the journey to the next level, I suppose. Gurukha, what's your views on that particular question? My view is that no one goes to the Golden Temple. If you are there, you are there because it's your destiny to be there. And the Guru has blessed you with that experience. If you're seeking, 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 it doesn't matter where you go. This experience is unique in all experiences. And if you don't have that blessing, you know, we pray in our Ardas for Darshan and Ishnan, our Mandrasa, that you can actually even have inside you. By the blessing of Guru Ramdas, this is his home, he built it. It's the richest, most beautiful house on the planet. And we all live in that house because we are prosperous people. And we have a great riches in our consciousness and in our lives. And now, touching on the point that you raised very briefly about pilgrimage and whether it's necessary. Um, I know that I know very little of Bani myself, but from what I know, Bani does say that pilgrimage isn't part of Sikhi, but it's a, a way of connecting, perhaps, the whole idea of having to go to one place of worship and having to go with lots of people isn't part of Sikhi, Yatra isn't part of Sikhi. That's my understanding and I may be wrong as to that, but that's certainly what many of the Gurus said. But as, as far as I understand it, what do you have to say about that? It's interesting you say that. It's a, it's a very, very widely held belief that there are certain things you don't do. Um, the way I've always looked at it, well not always, but um, you, know, you meet some people, they give you an insight, and it seems to be that if you haven't got the actual seed of love, or devotion, or a seeking thing, whatever you do is gonna be a bit wasted. So yeah, go on a pilgrimage, but I mean, if it's the, the true intent is there, why not? I don't think it's saying don't do pilgrimage, I think it's saying don't you know, just go and think you're going to do it by just going there and, uh, you know, do it in, you know, doing the motions, as it were, without the, the loving uh, devotion that goes behind that. And that is probably the bedrock of our, our uh, belief system. Without love, you've got nothing. Okay. Guruji is saying going through the motions doesn't cut it. you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Oh. Any, any further questions? Oh, <laughs> 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 well, yeah. Okay, if I could have, first of all, you. Sorry, I just want to add to that. So coming here isn't part of our religion, is it? Right, but we're going to go and we're going to pick something up. You can put it in a kitchen. 
Mm -hmm. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Sangha. 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 You know, so hopefully yeah. uh, the point there mm. kind of uh, ties into... In this case, destination is important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's, it's, we always yeah. say journey is more important than the destination, but in this case, it's the reverse. You, you get to see a lot, lot of other Sangha that you might mm -hmm. never have come across. Because if you're living in the UK, you have just the UK Sangha. If you're living in the States, you have the people just from there. Here you have everybody congregating in one place. Yep. So it's a different sort of atmosphere. That's not necessarily true though, because on a journey you learn lessons, and when you learn lessons, you can make your journey even better. Therefore, the destination that you end up being at could be even greater than had you not learned the lessons in the first place. It's like a stick, isn't it? Which bit's more important, the stick bit or the end? It's probably the same. It's it's a mini journey. <laughs> okay, in your destination. Yeah, <laughs> 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 I've got a question from you, and I'll take two more questions at this point. I'm just wondering whether the panel have anything to add on the same topic in relation to what we talked about. We're going to be in the whole way. So, in terms of us going to the Kosovo and going to the river, we're going to be having views on that. At the moment, we're talking about devotion and going to the pilgrimage and all that. But there's a fundamental as well. Yeah. I don't entirely agree with that because I'm dumb and you're not. So, no, no, rephrase, rephrase the question. Rephrase it, sorry. I didn't get it. Did you get it? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> He's saying then, why do we even go to the water? Oh, you have to stand up there. I do. Sorry, I'll pop you up. <clears throat> He's saying, why do we even go to the water? What makes someone great? Tell me. They do great things. People oh, remember it. <laughs> How does someone become great? What makes someone great? Do you understand the question? How do you become great? Being less than the other person. Look, Harmandra is built at the lowest point, right? It's not built on a mountain. The whole point of Gurdwara is that you have an isht. Isht is where you put your head down. <clears throat> it's where you surrender your ego. If you don't have that spot where you can give yourself and let go and surrender yourself, then you are lost. Greatness comes from bowing. All right, um, question from the sun. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the turban, um, that you need to have a turban. Six or the four turbans, actually. Did I say you need to have a turban? I don't remember saying that. Uh, maybe not in those words, but you know. <laughs> not even uh, not yourself, it's one of your dogs. You know. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure exactly who, but they give me. Guru Nanak didn't have a turban, as, as we know it today. If you take the aggression out of the Sikh history, and it was only about from the fifth guru onwards that we had aggression, and then if you promote history along that line, will we will be in this identity? That's the question. So what was Guru Nanak really trying to teach is purity of heart, sincerity, letting go of your attachment to exactly what you say. It's not about the person, actually. It's about being who you are, who you truly are. Guru Nanak said, truth is high, but high still is truthful living. What does that really mean? What it means is not lying to yourself. So, if you say something, you stick to it. It's not other people. It doesn't matter about other people. It's you count first. So when you are honest with yourself, that was Guru Nanaki's message, actually. And that is spirituality. And we can all be sick in any shape, form, whatsoever. It's not a necessity to have this identity. Yeah? So I disagree. But then you have 5Ks. So 5 Ks was with Guru Gobind. Yeah, no. And why was that? So was what don't we normally say is the Guru Gobind saying is the 10th Guru? Yeah. The same, same joke yeah. comes to... Exactly. Okay, um, sorry to interrupt. Can we just have questions rather than statements? I appreciate that there are people who have different views and it is going to be difficult to manage if everyone is making statements. So if I can have a question from yourself. Okay. Uh, question. Uh, Before you ask, I just want to say thank you. You made a beautiful point. Thank you for that. Thank you. I hope everyone heard it. It's a tough cookie, though. 
<laughs> Thank God for that. Also, if you can introduce yourselves and just a little, say a little bit about yourself, that might be nice. Yeah. Yes, one uh, question, but you can't speak in English, you can speak in Punjabi. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll come to you in a moment. Um, if I can have your question yeah. first, please. Sukhraj Thakkar, I um, work at Deloitte, senior manager. My question is, um, what place does uh, ritualism and superstition have in Sikhism? I'll give you an example. I came home one day and I've got a two-year-old son, he had chicken fox. And uh, my mother-in-law has got him wearing a red t-shirt. She put some rice out in my garden for some reason. <laughs> and she's got my wife matadig into a little doof or something. Like, it seems to be very yeah, everywhere, you know. So what does our religion say about Chicken pops, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Not chicken pops. <laughs> <laughs> superstitions. No, no, but why, why would the, what was the red, I'm sorry, I missed the cue. I, I meant these are superstitions <laughs> that she... So I thought I heard the word chicken. Yeah, chicken pops. Okay, yeah, yeah, chicken pops. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have an interesting take of that. Yeah. Yeah. It goes with this though, isn't it? Why well, do girls have to wear... Yeah, touch wood, <laughs> anything. There's so much superstition and ritualism around. What does our religion say about it? Because as I understand it, I don't think there's a place for it. Okay, um, if I can have two more questions. I've got another question from you, please. Hi, I'm Kukrit. Mine is more about heritage. When I was looking around the pictures and stuff, and you can see some very old pictures, but when you go to Harmandar Sahib now, you look there, you, all you see is white, white everywhere. We are not preserving our heritage. If you go to Europe, we can see really nice painting. You can walk around, take look, old pictures. You know, you have got beautiful pictures. But when we go to Harmandar Sahib, I mean, I struggle, you know, I've traveled from Punjab and like, you know, down Bombay as well, but it's very hard to get our heritage. I think it's just not about being Sikh, it's also about preserving what we had before. So, why okay. are we not saving And if I could say a question from yourself. Yes. Oh, no, no, you have to take a question from him. I will as well, so I'll take four in this round. <laughs> <laughs> so, My name is Reza, I'm a teacher. Mine's a bit of a historical question about the Arnold Scott. Um, my understanding is that Sikhi respects all religions and whoever sings the Bani is um, just as equal as anyone else. Why, my understanding is generations ago, even non Sikhs used to sing the Bani in the Hanandasa. Why has that suddenly changed? If they're singing the same Bani we are, they're, they're giving it the same respect. Why is that changed? Okay. And can we also have a question um, for the both of us? Um, no, 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 what is it? It's a mid sun. Mid sun means mid sun. Mid sun. Sun means 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 mid sun. With that question first, in respect of the uh, the Mahan and uh, do that in English, so I yes. terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, interesting. Nich Sang um, did the Nartik. I'm sure it's in there. You also mentioned Nihang. Nihang has many meanings. Nihang means horse. Nihang, Nihang means Nihangta. The Sanskrit. Nihang comes from the hang, the Persian for crocodile. Guru Sahib, no, Nich Sang. Nich Sang. Okay. 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 He's, he's doing a doctorate in Punjabi. No, I'd, 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 love to, I'd love to sit down and talk more, uh, okay. maybe afterwards. But all I'm saying is just to maybe a different opinion. The Nahangs themselves okay. trace it back to the way. But it's always a good thing. It's a good thing. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, if you want to speak to uh, Panji's okay. afterwards, you're more than welcome to continue the discussion. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Richard? Okay. Um, Rich? Pick up, guys. Yeah. Um, ritualism versus um, and superstition. That was one question that was asked. And what place does ritualism and superstition have within a Sikh context? Can I come on something here? A little private, please. Thank you so much. Okay. I said chicken pox because it was interesting. Because the mums are going to do something, aren't they? Yeah, look at chicken pox. They confuse it with smallpox, say Sikhala Devi, red, yeah. all that sort of stuff, right? This is um, the fascinating thing about Indian culture and about people who sort of see things and think there's, uh, if, if that person did it and they got better, then I'm going to do it and it might work for me, sort of mentality. Um, in terms of the spiritual doctrinal side, Guruka, I'm sure, will give you a tour de force on that. I just want to give you one tiny little example. Um, 
relating to this whole thing, ritualism. There was a time, uh, a few hundred years ago, before immunization was established in, the, in Europe and the West, the, the Indian Brahmins who were um, immunizing villages all over India um, from smallpox. They somehow figured out, you give them a bit of the vaccine, a uh, the bit of the, um, the actual virus, they get it overnight, it never comes back. So maybe out of self-interest or the philanthropy, i.e. if I'm relying on these people, I don't make sure they survive and I don't catch it, maybe that was the, the reason, or it was philanthropy, we've got to help humanity, they started this mass program of immunization. And what they do, they go to a village, set everyone down, and they cut, daub them with a bit of that virus, overnight, Mataji, Mataji's arrived, they, you know, they get a bit of a bit of fever and so on, and then they'll be all right after that and they'll be in trouble. And there'll be rituals and mantras read with this whole thing. Now those Brahmins would walk off, they'd take their um, in-kind goods, you know, grain and stuff, whatever they, the, the villagers could afford to pay them. And they'd walk off and go off, and guess what? People left behind, none the wiser, they don't understand the science, the technology, right? And they just keep that thing up. Right? Who's heard this one? Um, Second toe on a woman, if it's longer than the big toe, it means she's going to keep her hand to husband. <laughs> all sorts, there's all sorts of old wives' tales, they call them. But funnily enough, a lot of these things are probably steeped in some sort of scientific <laughs> principle. But yet, that's been lost. So that was just my little experience. Uh, this is perfect because you addressed superstition. Right? Because that's what superstition is, that you believe something is going to cause something else. And that's what he's talking about. So I'll address ritual. <clears throat> Then we have teamwork, right? <laughs> okay. What is a ritual? A ritual is something you go through without any experience or understanding of what it is you're doing. You do it because someone told you to do it or you saw someone do it, right? So we say you have to understand the difference between ceremony and ritual. Ceremony is done very consciously. You know like the Japanese tea ceremony? It's an exercise in, in meditation. You can experience it so simply in ardas. People go through it, just say ardas, but they don't actually do the ardas because the ardas is the voice of all the hearts of the Sangat. So when you really are present in the ardas, you know only the, the very beginning is written, right? And the very end, middle has been created over time. That middle part of the ardas is when you tune in and you meditate and whoever the Ardasi is, is disappearing, making themselves transparent to hear the prayers of the hearts of the Sangat and speak it. So ceremony is done consciously to alter the consciousness and a ritual is done by habit and rote. But most rituals were at one time ceremonies, but they lost the awareness and became rituals. Um, there were two questions which were asked about Sikh heritage. Um, the first was in respect of why we as a community are not preserving our heritage, and the example was given of Amritsar with its many white buildings um, and various um, pieces of heritage disappearing over time. The second question was in respect of the Dabar Sahib itself. The second question was in respect to the Dabar Sahib itself, and that was regarding why is Bani no longer um, sung in the Dabar Sahib by non-Sikhs? So, um, if I could ask either of you to address those questions. Okay. Um, Part one, heritage, preservation, white buildings. <clears throat> there was a time, and this is really apt that we're standing around this wonderful Perspex model. Uh, there was a time when the Sikhs had an empire, and the underpinnings of the empire was the devotional seed, as represented by the Harimanda, but also this uh, very important aspect of churning knowledge that took place in the buildings around the, uh, the Sarova and in the Pargarna. These are the Bungas. And who does the adas every day? Yes? You do the adas. Okay, where does the word bunga come up in the adas? Do you know? Remember? Yeah, fantastic. What is that? Can you recite that line? 
And uh, these are three things that this, we pray every day. The Adas is done at least, I think, twice a day in Goodbye, all, all over the world. All that consciousness coming together saying, may these things last forever. Only one Bunga exists to this day. That's the Ramgadi Bunga there. That's because they fought, fought you know, court cases to keep it alive. Everything else around was knocked down, dismantled, 1945. Well, you know, buildings, bricks and mortar, things get knocked down, fair enough. Right? Um, but the, the thing that the, is being referred to in the Adas is the fact that at one time these were established, establishments of education and learning. But the great masters were given the patronage to teach, they were well looked after, come here and teach the Sangha. Anyone who wishes to have free knowledge, the very best knowledge, let them have access to it. And that harks back to a time of Guru Gurma Singh where he had the Kavi Dalbar, brought the best poets and they translated the works from the, the Hindu and Islamic sort of civilization, the, the, the classics, so that people of the, of the time, the Sikhs, could access that knowledge in the language of the day, the lingua franca of the day, the Bakka. So we've got a real big issue. The story about their destruction and how it happened is connected to empires changing um, and the impulses of you know, the economics of it and so on and so forth, where your loyalty is lying. Um, you can't really turn that stuff back. No one's going to go in there and take control from the SGPC and sort of re-establish re these um, Punga. We've done it in Perspex to represent that it's a ghost town. This is once was. It doesn't exist like this. Um, the issue, though, is the knowledge. Where does the knowledge reside? Who has access to it? Who's preserving it? Can you, can you make use of it in this day and age? Um, that's a question for a, a point for a you know, much larger, longer, a very fulfilling debate, which we'll have one stage, I'm sure. Because the things that were going on there were incredible. From the philosophies and the theology to you know, spiritual experiences, all the way through to astronomy and mathematics. Nightly scientific debates going on. And you, you wouldn't associate that with the Sikhs now. <laughs> that level of sophistication that was once there. Um, so that's a real massive issue. And that's one that you know, we're trying to, events like this, you know, spearhead this whole movement to to reclaim what was uh, what is ours. The second point is about inside the Hamid Sahib. I'll just touch on this lightly. Um, if you come back, when you sit in this projector room, after all the film footage has gone through, wonderful vintage film footage, by the way, you'll hear um, Gifton being sung by Bai Ghulam Muhammad Jang. And he's a descendant, the son of one of the last great Rababis who sang at the Hamid Sahib. Now this is probably what, um, you're making probably a, that, was that the issue you were um, yeah, talking about? Generations ago, they were allowed, and now suddenly. Well, that's to do, it's connected to the whole politics. Coming down the Bunge, identity politics, um, a bit of a reform that turned into a revision kind of thing. I won't say any more than that. That basically said, you're not the turban Sikhs, therefore, you're out. Could it be that they, they were they they don't want to come there anymore? The other no, people? No, no, no. They're, they're crying to go back. And if 47 comes, the patronage is lost um, 20 years down the line, you know, they're saying we're going to Pakistan. It's more about control than ego. Well, that's always the case. Then, also, to, uh, to point out, there's an event that's going to be held here be, on the 17th of September, 18th of September, I stand corrected. Uh, there will be the uh, person who's just been mentioned. Bhai Galam Jan will be here, uh, potentially performing, I believe, in the lecture hall as part of the, the lecture series which is taking place to accompany the, uh, the exhibition. Can I just say, you see that uh, you're holding the gallery guide on the hand this side. If you could, everyone just take one of those, all the, the details are in there. Book your tickets, there's a lovely vegetarian Punjabi meal provided by a Punjab restaurant. Um, and you will enjoy it, I, I guarantee you. So all is your money back. Is he a descendant? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye, Bhai Mardana, um, the, the, his actual um, bloodline is disputed, okay. but the Rabbi tradition, like Marasi's, yeah, there's a teaching lineage that comes down. The Rabbi, they're the place of the Rabbi. Hardly anyone plays the Rabbi anymore, but they preserve the vocal style of singing, the Nassau, the Shabbat. And they consider themselves Muslim Sikhs, right? It's fantastic. Marids, there's a name for them, Marids. You know the Nahangs? This is fascinating. You're on a roll. <laughs> 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 Downwards, that's how my momentum is taking. Um, 
Uh, you've all heard of the Nahans, right? Um, every day, you know they provide that, that, that thing, <laughs> that drink. <laughs> 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 you won't take one in, the, the uh, Sukhnidan they call it, the, the treasure house of bliss. Treasure of bliss. They prepare two versions every day. Many of them won't know why, but they just do it. It's part of the ritual thing. There was once a reason, and the reason's come down, um, luckily it's been preserved. The, the version that is prepared with sugar, is for the Shaheeds. These are the Hindus or Sikhs, as it were, in all the context, who gave up their lives for the Guru's course. And they also prepare a version without the sugar for the, to commemorate the Marines. And these are the Muslims who gave up their lives for the Guru's course. So it's very fascinating that these things, I mean, hardly anyone knows this stuff, but it's a, it's a massive part of our heritage. Guru, Guru Gobind Singh had an army of Muslims. Uh, the missiles period, the Muslims um, manning the uh, in the armies, in the Jeet Singh's army, the Muslims, it was, it, there was no issue. In every major Gurdwara, they had Rababis, these Muslims, doing the singing, because they were phenomenal singers. And in a place like this, if you don't get the best singers, and lots of people are coming in, and you put them off with bad singers. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that budget don't sound good one day, you're squeaky and your voice ain't up to it. I mean, yeah, Shadow does one thing, but you've got to make sure you don't sing them off. That's why they got the best. And they were once the best. Okay, we've got time for three more questions. Uh, if we can have uh, another question from a woman, because we've got uh, a few. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, perfect. Um, I was wondering, obviously we were talking about ceremony before, and we haven't really mentioned women within Sikhism very much. But obviously, having just got married, I was quite fascinated with why, how the Nandgaraj came about, and why women follow men under the Nandgaraj side. Because there's nowhere in the Guru Granth Sahib that it actually states that women have to follow the men. And I think it was Sai and I had a, or you know, a friend that on the last, um, like last Fira, they both went round together. They actually stood side by side and went round together. But why is that so, like... It I thought it's because the women had the remote control. Right, if, if I could have uh, two more questions. Um, okay, if I could have a question from yourself and a question from you. You can start first. Okay, okay yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say that, first of all, just a quick introduction. I think um, uh, my name is Dr. Sally, uh, and I, I run my own company, but that's my introduction. Uh, with regards to the exhibition, it's fantastic. It's my first time here. And I think it's things like this which are really good in terms of promoting that education that we really need. My question really is that, and, I, and I, a conversation we had the other day about Guru Ganesh who plays with uh, Sanat and Kaur, and I, I was with him a couple of years ago, and I said, wow, look at this Sikh Gurdwara in South Hall. isn't it massive, isn't it great? And uh, look at all the money that they spend, and he said it shows the love that people have for the building, or for the fact that they built it. And I look at things like Sikhnet, and I look at things like um, all, the, you know, all the resources that we need to educate ourselves, right? And I think to myself, what can we do as individuals to help convince possibly the SGP, the PC, or maybe the Gurdwara committees? Because we put that money in those Gurdwaras, right? But how can we actually say to them, maybe you should do something like you're doing here, or maybe more exhibitions, or a school campaign, or the thing that you were talking spoke about when you went to those kids. I did a scout thing, and at the end of the scout thing, it's like, well, Sikhs are really cool, you know? But you know, the more we do that, or more money we have to do that kind of stuff, so the, the central question really is, what can we do as individuals to help maybe convince those people that hold the money that we put in the Gurdwaras to use that money in different ways? And yourself? My name is uh, I just wanted to ask, for those who haven't taken Amulet, how do you know when you're ready to take Amulet? Because uh, I've asked other people this question and they say, you just know. But I think it would be helpful for those who have taken on that to tell us a little bit about what they went through or what was the turning point for them, because I think it would help um, those of us who haven't taken on that to, to understand okay, whether they'd be ready or not. Yeah, that was simple, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, one more question. Uh, at an event last week uh, at the Second Seek and Success event, uh, there was a question around how uh, Sikhism would influence our working life. And the speakers were saying that uh, our gurus, apart from being gurus and holy and spiritual, were also diplomats and leaders and managers. And I had not made that connection until last week. I might be the only one. And I'm keen to read more about that. 
you suggest any view that, that I could read on that topic? And if not, if there, if there is none, should one of us write something on that? On that topic. Okay. There's a really good book, uh, Percussions of History by Jigjit Singh. Um, and it sums up. Can you just raise your voice? There's, there's a book by Jigjit Singh, it's called Percussions of History. And it uh, sums up the politics that the gurus played when they were alive, um, how they swayed on one side because it protected the Sikhs or the Hindus or whatever religion that was being. Um, of, uh, Persecute. Yeah, persecuted at that time. So, yeah, they, as, as uh, my brother over here was saying, you know, they, they did play a lot of a political role, and that book really sums it up really well. Percussions of history. Okay. Um, first question was in respect of the Anand Garage. Uh, how did the Anand Garage come about, and why do the women follow? Uh, why does a woman follow a man around the Gurugram the side? If I could ask Guru Gassing to... Uh... I just want to add to that as well. Obviously, we talk a lot about equality within Sikhism, yeah. so based on that. Well, first of all, you know the marriage ceremony, the Hindu marriage ceremony, people walked around the fire, right? So because our Guru is the Shabbat, the whole Lavan is designed to engrave in your consciousness that the Guru is the center of your life as a married couple. That you orbit around the Shabbat Guru. The reason that the woman is behind and the man in front is very simple. Have you ever ridden in a carriage? Who holds the reins? The horse is in front and the driver holds the reins in back. <laughs> That's what that Paula is, you know. <laughs> but touching on a more serious point, in respect of that, many, many people, but many women, I would assume, do feel that there is an equality within the way that Sikhi is practiced in the present day, when Gurbani teaches us that men and women are equal. How can that be overcome? By the women. Yeah. But on top of that, you've just mentioned, obviously, it comes from Hindu traditions. So, why is it that, okay, fair enough, the men go first, but the women actually go around first a couple of times as well? And so how did that not kind of transition into a Oh, is it? Men don't, don't have the much. reins, do you remember? So. <laughs> is, it, is, it the, is it the man the horse comes comes and then the woman and then the man? Right, the right right. Yeah, I think they yeah. do like seven, so the guy does yeah. four and the woman because does three. Because we're not in competition. There is no competition. Yeah. There's no competition because the Shabbat Guru, when it talks to us, it talks to all of us as women. We only have one husband. It, our soul is not masculine or feminine. Yeah? And when you read Gurbani, the amount of times that Gurbani gives reference to how do you do Simran? Well, a mother will tell you. You know, how does she look after her baby? She's driving the car, she's doing it, but she knows what needs to be done. And it's just instinct when you, you know, you, you're having a shower, but the, something's happening, the baby monitor's not working, you run, and the kid's on the edge of the bed. That's, that's the guru. That's us. That's how we need to, that's our vibration. It's within us. It's our fine tuning. So that if you, if you focus too much on the, you know, we're going around the mat, then you will become that. But you have to divorce yourself from that when you come in front of the guru, because there is no man and no woman in front of the guru. And my understanding historically was we never went round. We would stand, the guru would say, Har Pallari love, we'd listen. Okay, I know it's going to be hard. We promise that we're not going to, you know, we have to do it again and again. So you, Matha take, you say, I promise that I'm going to stick to this first round. You put, bow your head, you put your head down, but your heart remains up when you Matha take. So you surrender. And then you sit back down, and then you do it the second time, the third, and the fourth. So, you know, like if you, if you want to compare why do the Hindus do this, or, the, there is nothing to compare. There's no, nothing, because your guru held you as their daughter so high, so high. Actually, 16 times, what was that? 16 times more intelligent than a man? <laughs> okay, he says eight times. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, you must be... Uh, <laughs> but, uh, the discussion is over because he gave me the womb. He gave me the womb, he gave me the, the essence to hold the family, you know? When we screw up, 
you know, and I'm talking to myself. When we screw up and we mess up, we see it smack in our face. It's there. And I we have nobody to blame other than ourselves. So we have no option. They can marry a saint. We have to be the same. You know, they can serve us. We, we have to be it. We have to be that. And give the, birth to a saint. Yeah. You can only do that when you fall again and again and you stand up and you say, okay, this man and me, we're going to be together, even though it's going to be so, the journey is not easy. Ask anyone who's married. You know, you think one year, two year, but when you live it, that's why all the babies were married. You know, as far as we can tell, okay, I know not the childhood, whatever, but at the, that point, we were told to live in Grist, because Gristi is the highest form of our meditation every day to get through the crap and still stand up and say, actually, in this man's eyes, in this woman's eyes, I have to see the guru. He's got it. It's just the training ground, like the toy car. You know, the children are driving the toy car. They think they're going somewhere. So you have the marriage with the man and you think, and it's the grounding to get to the other level. But you can't do it without the regress. So don't concentrate on, you know, the, the bits that physically or you know emotionally that's just our western brain saying oh the man's doing this the man there's no man there's no woman in this you're just all the same you're just you're invisible and the guru is your power the socket that Paramji talked about you plug yourself in every morning and it helps okay um moving on to um the second question uh, which was raised that was in response of the, the money that often goes towards many Godwadas, many Sikh institutions. And about, if I got this right, it's almost like lobbying in order to ensure that that money is used appropriately. Mm. And lobbying the, those Sikh institutions and yeah. telling them what... We've got the ability to do it. What can we do to help engineer that? As in the Channel that money appropriately. Yeah. It's our money. <laughs> money makes the world go round. Uh, right, old example, new example. Old example, patronage paid for um, a, a culture of learning. Guru Gobind Singh gave the example, it used to happen around the Hermanda So you've got a very good uh, precedent that you should always put your money, if you're, if you're keen, into quality, to something that's going to last, find the right projects and so on and so forth. That's, 